Island. Okay, let's quickly go over who the Sentinelese are first. Let's orient ourselves to person, place, and time. Where is North Sentinel Island, where the Sentinelese live? That island is in the Bay of Bengal. It's off the east of India, between India and Myanmar, way out in the middle of the ocean. It's part of the Andaman Island archipelago. And frankly, if that means as little to you as it does to me, it might as well be in the Sea of Tranquility on the moon. So look it up on a map. The point is, it's very remote. It is surrounded by a reef. There's no good place to try to dock a ship. But the beach is actually pretty beautiful. The beach is about 40 meters wide and bordered by a dense tropical evergreen forest. Really, it's a pretty idyllic place. You can see why the Sentinelese defend it so aggressively. What about the people themselves? Well, according to most reports, they're very small. The men are about 1.6 meters high, so about 5 feet 3 inches. The women, a little shorter. It's thought they might be an example of a form of island dwarfism. Remember, we have talked about island dwarfism before when we talked about Homo floresiensis, Hobbit Man, 1.1 meters high, living on their little island in Indonesia, hunting tiny little elephants. Just the cutest thing you've ever heard of. That's insular or island dwarfism, and it's possible that that same effect has affected the Sentinelese. But I have to say, if you look at pictures of them, despite their small stature, they're pretty strong. They're pretty ripped. Very little body fat. According to a 2014 circumnavigation of the island, the researchers said their height is around 1.6 meters and their skin color is, quote, dark, shining black with well-aligned teeth. They show no signs of obesity and have very prominent muscles, end quote. And of course, the take home here is, even though they're not large, they're pretty formidable. One of the big mysteries about the Sentinelese is how many of them are there? They live in a dense forest, very difficult to get a census. Estimates are as low as 15, that's right, 1-5 Sentinelese on the entire island, and as high as 500 I've seen, although most people think 200 would be the absolute max upper limit possible for their population. So if you want to talk about one of the languages in the world spoken by the fewest possible people, this might be it. If you spent years learning North Sentinel Island dialect, you would only be able to speak to maybe 15, possibly up to 200 people on the planet. You'd be a lot better off learning Mandarin or Spanish or something like that. Not a lot of markets looking to expand onto the North Sentinel Island. When you realize how sparse the population is, you see it's really not that hard to eke out a living on North Sentinel Island. There's only 50 to 200 people max that are going to compete with you for all the resources. So what do the Sentinelese eat? One thing we know from people who have actually made it into their village and didn't end up getting buried in the sand of the beach, made it back out again alive, the Sentinelese love mollusks. There are mollusk shells everywhere, and most of them were roasted in a fire, so we know that every night is a clam bake on North Sentinel Island. They're living the good life, eating all the shellfish. They also eat quite a few mud crab, which doesn't sound nearly as appetizing, and they hunt terrestrial animals with their spears and bows and arrows. And beyond that, there is a decided lack of agriculture. These are full-on hunter-gatherers. As far as clothing goes, this style is, let's admit it, mostly nude. They do wear some bark strings. Men tuck daggers into their waist belts. If they're rich or fancy or just have the inclination, they might wear a headband or a necklace. Because, of course, even in an isolated tribe, you gotta do you. You can't be afraid of being a little different. As far as their housing goes, from everything everyone's seen, it seems to be kind of temporary. They erect huts on four poles with slant leaf roofs and then seem to move around quite a bit. None of the huts seem to be permanent. They don't build any grand architecture. It might be surprising with these pretty primitive conditions, but it appears that the Sentinelese do appreciate the value of metal. They scavenge metal from shipwrecks to make tools and weapons. They accept aluminum cookware when the National Geographic Society dropped off some aluminum cooking pans in 1974. It's one of the few things that the Sentinelese actually accepted as gifts. There's no evidence that they understand metallurgy, although they can do some cold forging to turn metal into arrow and spearheads. And as far as their transportation technology goes, they do have canoes, but the canoes are pushed around by poles. They don't use the canoes to navigate around the island. 
They go out into the lagoons behind the coral reefs and fish in these canoes by pushing them around with poles. So their lives are what most of us would stereotypically call primitive. In fact, it seems to be zealously and guardedly primitive. They don't want technological enhancements. They want the metal because it's already incorporated into their material culture, but then they form it to their own use. They aren't looking to expand their technological horizons. The decorations on what few material items they have, like their spears and weapons, are simple geometric patterns, some color shading. We don't know much about their singing, if they have a song catalog of Sentinelese hits. But when they dance, it's also what we would consider fairly rudimentary. Nothing elaborate or complicated. They bend over a little bit, slap their thighs, stomp around on their feet rhythmically. Not much going on there, at least as far as we know. They may have massive productions with all 200 people. Highly choreographed productions, we just don't know that. And it seems frankly very unlikely. And I'll just bring up one more interesting point since it will become relevant when we talk about John Allen Chow. That is that the North Sentinelese, the bow and arrow that they shoot with, the arrow is 2.5 meters long. Think about that. That is taller than 99% of the adult males on the planet. They're essentially shooting a spear from a bow. Now, the reason for this is hard to identify because we can't speak to them. Some experts think they may travel better in water, float better, be easier to find in the dense jungle where these sentinelese live, but we really don't know. But when John Allen Chow comes to the island, when boats stray off course and come too close to the shore, they are being greeted with 2.5 meter missiles being fired from bows. And finally, I just want to drive home the point, since we're talking about their culture, about their language. That is, Nobody speaks Sentinelese except the Sentinelese. Their language is so unknown that it's even unclassified. They can't even speak to their closest neighbors on the Andaman Islands. So all we know about them is from what we see them do and what we see in their material culture. Mesh baskets, dead crabs, dead mollusks, wooden adzes with metal tips, and an obvious dislike for visitors. Now let's talk about this obvious dislike for visitors. By going through a list of the major contacts over the centuries with the North Sentinelese. Now, this is not exhaustive by any means, but I think it is fairly representative. We go all the way back to 1296, and it's reported, some claim anyway, that Marco Polo was the first European to visit North Sentinel Island. Polo was not very flattering, talking about the Andamanese people in his diary. He described them as cannibals with, quote, a most brutish and savage race, having heads, eyes, and teeth like those of a dog, end quote. Historians don't believe he actually visited North Sentinel Island. He probably made those remarks based on what we would now call urban legends, but on tales of sailors who had traveled to the Andaman Islands. Greatly exaggerated and horribly racist. You have to go from 1296 all the way to 1771 for the next possible mention. In fact, this was the first definite mention, considering the apocryphal nature of Marco Polo's journal entry, of a European ship encountering North Sentinel Island. There, in 1771, an East India Company vessel named the Diligent sailed past Sentinel Island and saw, quote, a multitude of lights gleaming on the shore, end quote. The ship did not go investigate, stayed far away from the very dangerous coral reef. It was on a surveying mission and had to continue on its way. But that's the first official mention in European logbooks of life on Sentinel Island. It's really striking how rare these contacts were, because then you have to go to 1867 to the first major mano a mano, human to human contact between Europeans and the North Sentinelese. In 1867, the Nineveh, which was an Indian merchant ship, ran aground on the reef around North Sentinel Island. 86 passengers and 20 crew swam their way to the shore. They landed on the beach. They huddled there for three days before the Sentinelese decided they'd had enough of these intruders. They had overstayed their welcome, so to speak. And they brought out their iron-tipped arrows and bows and began shooting at these interlopers. The ship's captain described the people who attacked them as, quote, perfectly naked with short hair and red-painted noses. They were opening their mouth and making sounds like pa, en, off, and their arrows appeared to be tipped with iron, end quote. Of course, we only have the Nineveh side of the story. We don't really know how it went according to the North Sentinelese. I'm happy to say that the Nineveh crew and passengers were saved by the Royal Navy, 
after they stood off against the North Sentinelese arrow attack for a few days using rocks and stones and so forth. So that encounter could have gone much worse than it actually did. The point is, the North Sentinelese were already not welcoming intruders with open arms by 1867. But we have to say the events of 1880 and Maurice Vidal Portman, the British Navy officer, might have made them that much more hostile to foreigners. In 1879, Maurice Vidal Portman, hereafter I'll just call him Portman, he's made the officer in charge of the Andamanese Islands. And for more than 20 years, he pacified, as he called it, the tribes in this area. Of course, what that meant to Portman, this was of course the British Empire at the time, is that he was going to teach them their place, teach them some civilized manners, even at the point of a gun or a bayonet or a sword. So it's already not going to go well to try to force European civilization on these people. But it's even worse because Portman was a total creep. And his desire to civilize the Andamanese began with kidnapping, disease, death, and ended up in a book full of creepy photographs of nude male islanders posing like Greek heroes. Portman, of course, records his glorious deeds in a book called A History of Our Relations with the Andamanese. There he writes about a trip to North Sentinel Island in 1880, where he takes Europeans and a group of six convicts. They go to the island and they search around for representative peoples from the North Sentinel Island. The North Sentinelese are smart enough to try to evade him. But eventually Portman captures six people from the North Sentinel tribes. One old man, one old woman, and four children. He says he's capturing them, quote, in the interest of science, end quote. As you know, this didn't go well. According to Portman, quote, they sickened rapidly and the old man and his wife died. So the four children were sent back to their home with quantities of presents, end quote. Now, if you have to wonder why the North Sentinelese are so hostile to visitors, but also fairly suspicious and hostile of any gifts that visitors give them, I think this incident is telling enough. These four children are sick with the same illness that had just killed the old man and the old woman. Portman, possibly touched by conscience, gives the kids a bunch of gifts and sends them back to North Sentinel Island, whereupon we don't know how many North Sentinelese with no natural immunity to European diseases, die. So, for all the North Sentinelese know, the gifts that the Europeans gave the children made everybody sick and die in the tribe. Or possibly it was the Europeans themselves. Either way, the only logical reaction to this would be a strong aversion to gifts from foreigners and the foreigners bringing the gifts. So it doesn't make much sense for people to try to visit the North Sentinelese and say, oh, we're just trying to improve their lives. We're just trying to give them nice things. Why are they so hostile? Well, this event alone would make you very hostile. And we have to admit that hostility has been adaptive. They've preserved their cultural identity, their way of life. It's probable that I've been a little bit too hard on Captain Portman. Later in his life, to his credit, he regretted inflicting himself on the Andamanese people and the North Sentinelese. In an address to the Royal London Geographical Society, he said, quote, their association, meaning the Andamanese Islanders, of which the North Sentinelese are one, their association with outsiders has brought them nothing but harm. And it is a matter of great regret to me that such a pleasant race are so rapidly becoming extinct. End quote. Let's go to 16 years later, 1896, when we have our next recorded encounter between the North Sentinelese and civilized Westerners. And I say that tongue in cheek. An escaped convict from the Great Andaman Penal Colony. This is in 1896. He escapes from the penal colony by building a makeshift raft. Sets out to sea, probably thinks he has found salvation and freedom when he sees the shore of North Sentinel Island. The search party looking for the convict follows the ocean currents, makes its way also to North Sentinel Island, and there they find the convict. The convict is not faring so well. His body is full of arrow wounds, and his throat has been cut, and he's lying on the beach. So you could say this was a little bit like escaping from Alcatraz, where they say, if the cold doesn't get you, the current will, and if the current doesn't get you, the sharks will, and so forth. Well, if you escape from the great Andamanese penal colony and make your way to North Sentinel Island, you've gone out of the frying pan into the fire. Especially if the memory of the kidnappings, sickness, and death, and the unwelcome gifts that Portman had inflicted on the North Sentinelese just a few years earlier was still strong in their minds. 
Let's fast forward now all the way to 1967. That's when the legendary anthropologist T.N. Pandit made contact, the most and the best, the highest quality contact with the Norse Sentinelese in history. Pandit was an Indian anthropologist working for the Anthropological Survey of India. He was officially tasked by the government to go visit and make connection and friendship, if possible, with the Norse Sentinelese. His first excursion to the island came in 1967. About 20 people, Navy officers, Army officers, a regional governor, Pandit leading all of them, approach North Sentinel Island. While they're still a ways away, they use their binoculars and they see a group of people huddled on the beach. As soon as the people, the North Sentinelese, see them, they run back into the forest. They didn't want to be seen. Pandit and his crew follow their footprints and after about a kilometer, they find a group of 18 huts. The first time that Sentinelese huts had ever been described. 18 huts, lean-tos made from grass and leaves, and in front of every single hut, a small fire, and the small fire is still burning. That's how fast the people got out of there when they saw this group approaching. Pandit and his team wait around, see if anyone will come back, but no one comes back. They fail to make any contact with any North Sentinelese during this trip. They are able, however, to catalog some of the items of material culture. They found raw honey, skeletal remains of pigs, wild fruits, an axe, multi-pronged wooden spear, bows, arrows, cane baskets, fishing nets, bamboo pots, and wooden buckets. Metalworking was evident. Again, they were cold forging as they were making weapons, spear points, and so forth out of salvaged metal. But since nobody ever came back, they simply left gifts and went their way. That wasn't the end of the story, though. Pandit came back several times, and many of the trips there were quite successful. In fact, you can watch video footage of encounters between the North Sentinelese and these teams that were led by Pandit. Many of these missions had the best of motives. For example, the Indian government became concerned because mercenary outlaws were using the North Sentinel Island as a place to stop off. And the Indian government considered the North Sentinelese very vulnerable to exploitation or even extinction. So they erected a stone in 1970, declared North Sentinel Island part of India, and began to run some fairly regular patrols. Pandit came back to the North Sentinelese several times in the 70s and 80s. Often, though, it was almost like tours of official dignitaries. He would be an expert advisor to these tours. Possibly he was trying to mitigate or minimize some of the damage that these tours could do to the North Sentinelese. But other times he seemed like a glorified, well-educated tour guide. The Sentinelese reception to these various tours was mixed. At times they seemed to be receptive and welcoming. Other times they would turn their back and assume a defecating posture, which Pandit, with his years of anthropological training, was able to decipher as an unwelcoming gesture. Something about people turning around and acting like they're pooping on you was not very welcoming in the eyes of the renowned anthropologist T.N. Pandit. Many of these expeditions, you can look at the footage from 1987, 1992, they were filmed. And you can see the North Sentinelese people in those videos. Even during the best of times, though, when relations were the most positive, you never knew what you were going to get. Take the National Geographic filming expedition of 1974. Again, one of Pandit's expeditions. Early 1974, National Geographic film crew goes to the island with a team of anthropologists, including Pandit, accompanied by armed police to film a documentary. You can see the documentary online. It's called Man in Search of Man. You can still watch it to this day. They wanted to spread the operation of gift giving over three days, wanted to establish friendly contact and film the whole thing. But for some reason, this day in 1974 was not the day for that. As soon as the boat carrying the National Geographic crew came through the barrier reef, the North Sentinelese began to shoot these 6.5 meter arrows at the crew. Fearing the arrows, the crew landed some distance off. They went to a place where there were no North Sentinelese shooting arrows at them and left several gifts on the beach and filmed this. The gifts that they left were somewhat unusual. They sent a miniature plastic car, some coconuts, a live pig, a doll, and aluminum cookware. After the crew from National Geographic left the shore and got back on the boat, the Sentinelese launched another volley of arrows at them. And one of the arrows actually hit a cameraman in the leg, wounding him. The islander who hit the guy in the leg went to the tree line and started laughing his head off. Couldn't have been happier that he just speared this guy in the leg with his arrow. 
And if that wasn't contemptuous enough, they skewered the doll, skewered the pig, buried both of them in the sand in a very demonstrative way. The only things they took were the coconut and the aluminum cookware. On another visit to the island in 1975, no less a dignitary than King Leopold III of Belgium, in exile at the time, visited the Sentinelese on North Sentinel Island. According to an eyewitness who was there at the time, quote, As soon as his boat got too close, they, the Sentinelese, shot an arrow in his direction. The king was overjoyed and said it was the best day of his life, end quote. So clearly, King Leopold III in exile had a drinking habit. Otherwise, that makes no sense whatsoever. But he delighted in the antics of the North Sentinelese. In 1977, a ship named the Rusley, R-U-S-L-E-Y, apparently wrecked on the north side of Sentinel Island. I can find nothing else about that. I'm bringing this up because I have one reference to that in an internet article. I don't even know if it's true. I've tried to look at aerial photographs, see if I could spot the wreck of the Rusley. I have no information about it. If any of you listening to this podcast have any information about the wreck of the Rusley, please contact me at thobhpodcast at gmail.com. That is thobhpodcast at gmail.com. I would love to learn a little bit more about the wreck of the Rusley. Now, this next event takes place during the same time that Pandit and his various dignitaries are taking small excursions to the island, to North Sentinel Island. That is the 1981 wreck of the Primrose. And unlike the Rusley, this is what we would call a major encounter. 1981, August 2, the MV Primrose, carrying cargo of chicken feed from Bangladesh to Australia, runs aground in the rough seas off North Sentinel Island. The captain and a small crew are stranded with the Primrose while they're waiting for salvage or rescue teams to arrive. Well, after they're there a couple of days, they issue a distress call asking for firearms and boats immediately, saying that they are under attack by the North Sentinelese. According to the captain's report, as he's sitting on his stranded ship, minding his own business, he sees a bunch of canoes being pushed by poles, making their way out to the Primrose with up to 50 islanders shooting arrows at it, trying to board the vessel. And it seems they might have been successful in taking over the Primrose, except that strong wind, strong current drove them back to the shore. But the captain and his crew were pretty sure they weren't done. They were going to try again. There were about 30 crew members on board the Primrose. They grabbed axes, pipes, flare guns, anything they could to defend themselves and kept a 24-hour vigil over the Primrose, fearing another invasion, another attack. And for reasons I don't understand, the crew had to live in this condition for about another week until a helicopter came and rescued them. After the captain and crew were taken off of the Primrose, witnesses saw the Sentinelese people combing the deck, scouring the ship for metal implements that they could make into weapons. And that was not the end of the story of the Primrose and the North Sentinelese. In 1991, M.A. Muhammad and five of his brothers were awarded a contract to salvage the Primrose, to go to North Sentinel Island and salvage the Primrose, accompanied, of course, by Indian police to protect them. And for some reason, I'm not sure what the cultural schizophrenia was here, The Sentinelese were very friendly to this group of brothers. They would exchange fruit for small metal pieces. They would row out on canoes and have friendly exchanges with the brothers. According to one of the five salvage team members, quote, After two days in the early morning, when it was low tide, we saw three Sentinelese canoes with about a dozen men 50 feet away from the deck of the Primrose. We were skeptical and scared and had no other solution but to bring out our supply of bananas and show it to them, to attract them and minimize any chance of hostility. They took the bananas and came up on board the Primrose and were frantically looking around for smaller pieces of metal scrap. They visited regularly at least twice or thrice in a month while we worked at the site for about 18 months. So they had multiple non-hostile interactions with the North Sentinelese while they were salvaging this ship. Maybe they knew what policemen with guns meant. Maybe they wanted the ship gone as much as Mohammed and his salvage crew wanted it gone. We just don't know. But the relations were downright amiable. One of Pandit's last visits to the island was in 1991, just before he retired. This was a very interesting visit. It was considered a very successful visit because a group of islanders came to the beach to collect gifts offered by Pandit and his team with no weapons, just woven baskets 
and the axes that they used to cut open the coconuts, was really the first time they had encountered such a large group of unarmed Sentinelese. When you see the footage from this encounter, you see that the people are so close they could easily touch. This is the closest the Sentinelese had ever gotten to one of their teams before. At some point after dropping off gifts, Pandit and his teams went back to the boats and then came back. The second time they came back on that same day, there was a strange ritual, I guess you would call it, that played out. When they first approached, there was a Sentinelese man aiming his arrow at them. A woman standing next to the man pushed the bow and arrow down. The man lowered the bow and arrow at her push and buried it in the sand. This was considered possibly some kind of ritualistic display of burying hostilities. Very interesting. Whatever was going on there, as soon as the bow and arrow was buried in the sand, the Sentinelese rushed out to the boats of Pandit's team to collect their coconuts. And in fact, the Sentinelese were in such good humor that one of the crew from Pandit's team was throwing coconuts to them and hit a woman in the back of... <laughs> hit a Sentinelese woman in the back of the head with a coconut. Just bounced it off her skull. Not one of the great moments in the history of cultural bridging. You can just imagine the tension in the air, the fear that Pandit and his party probably felt. But instead of attacking with arrows, the Sentinelese checked to see what was going on, realized it was an accident, and let it pass. Unfortunately, though, this is as far as relations ever got between Pandit's team and the North Sentinelese. Imagine this very unequal relationship. The North Sentinelese would accept only certain gifts, coconuts and very few other things. They never offered any gifts in return. And they never once invited these strangers to come onto their island, to visit their village, never gave them food, never offered any hospitality whatsoever. Their hospitality consisted in not trying to kill the visitors. That was, as I said, as good as it ever got. 1991 were the halcyon days of North Sentinelese contact. In 1996, because nothing was happening, there was no real point to it. There was no cultural understanding taking place. Nothing more was known about the Sentinelese. In 1996, the Indian government canceled these visits. There were no more official visits until 2004. 2004, there was a tsunami. The Indian government was concerned about the welfare of the North Sentinelese people and sent a helicopter to check on them. The helicopter was greeted with islanders shooting arrows at it. The old order of hostility had returned in full force. And you can see online the famous photograph of a North Sentinelese man shooting an arrow at the helicopter taken from the helicopter's vantage point. Why they had become so hostile again, difficult to say. We don't know if they were mad about the supply of coconut gifts being cut off. We don't know if they held an election and the new elected leader was a little more jingoistic, a little more hawkish. Of course, that seems unlikely. But whatever happened, North Sentinel Island was once again a very dangerous place to approach as two Indian fishermen found out in 2006. Sundar Raj and Pandit Tiwari were killed in 2006. And since that is so recent, we still have news articles from right around that time that we can easily access. This article is from Survival Magazine, February 6, 2006. It says, Members of the world's most isolated tribe, the Sentinelese of the Andaman Islands, have killed two fishermen who had illegally approached their island. The Sentinelese, who were photographed after the December 2004 tsunami, firing an arrow at a helicopter over their island, that's what I just referred to, have resisted contact with the outside world for up to 60,000 years. They are under threat, the article says, from poachers illegally fishing and diving for lobster around their island. A little later it says, The tribe killed the two men, Sundar Raj and Pandit Tiwari, on 26 January, after they had slept overnight in their boat near North Sentinel Island. It's illegal to go within five kilometers of North Sentinel Island in order to protect the Sentinelese from exploitation, violence, and diseases to which they have no immunity. But increasing numbers of people from neighboring islands visit the island to dive for lobster close to the shore and to hunt for pigs on the island, depriving the tribe of essential foodstuffs. Now, according to an article from Yahoo News Australia, the death of these two fishermen was anything but peaceful. They were killed, and their bodies were hung up on poles displayed like scarecrows. It's obvious the North Sentinelese were trying to send a message. What became of the bodies of these two fishermen, I can't 
definitively say. According to one source I checked, the Coast Guard, the Indian Coast Guard, was able to retrieve one of the bodies, despite a hail of arrows they were met with when they went to North Sentinel Island. According to another source, they were unable to retrieve any of the bodies. The point is, the North Sentinelese were not getting more and more receptive, more open, more friendly, and more welcoming of outsiders. This is 2006, and their level of hostility was higher than it had been at many, many other points in the past. It is into that environment that John Allen Chow waited in attempting to convert the North Sentinelese to Christianity. He was, according to everything I can see and read about him, a happy, well-adjusted, seemingly bright individual. And according to your perspective, he was either a hero, somebody who was willing to help others at great personal peril, at even the sacrifice of his own life, trying to save their immortal souls, Or he was somebody who had no respect for the customs of these people and no concern that he was exposing them to serious risk, serious illness in attempting to inflict his own worldview on them. Which one is it? We'll talk about that in the next episode of the History of Being Human podcast.